Dry fly fishing is the toughest style of fly fishing to master. To catch the pickiest, biggest fish on dry flies demands, honestly, near perfection of your cast and your presentation and a fantastic understanding of any given hatch. Is there any feeling worse than getting into a great dry fly hatch only to slowly watch every fish either refuse your dry fly or just quit rising altogether? It's maddening. But how exactly do you gain the skills you need in order to avoid that situation? Is it really as simple as practice makes perfect or is there more to it than that? On today's episode of Untangled, I'll walk you through the lessons and techniques I learned from guides and other experts and give you the roadmap that you need to become an excellent dry fly angler. This is Untangled, fly fishing for everyone, presented by Ventures Fly Co. Hey everybody, welcome to it. This is Untangled and I am your host, Spencer Durant. So I, I do have that roadmap of skills that you need to to gain and to understand to become a great dry fly angler. But before I get into those specifics, I want to set the stage a little bit with the story. So years ago, I was out on the, shoot, I don't even remember how long ago it was, but I, I, I was out on the frying pan river in Colorado in February. It is not the best time of year uh, to hit that fishery if you're interested, but if you do get a decent warm spell, there there might be a small mid hatch, and you might get lucky and get into some decent fish coming up to dry flies. Plus, there are some very large fish in the frying pan, and if you go in the off season, it's a little bit less crowded. Well, I was out there with my good friends Ryan McCullough and Mysis Mike Kingsbury. I've talked about both of those fellers on the show before. Uh, they're wonderful anglers, and uh, honestly, Ryan and Mike are. They're probably the the two best anglers I know who've never guided or even been interested in guiding because they're masters, but they like way, they like to fish way too much <laughs> to become a guide. That, that's one of the myths of guiding. You, you think you get a fish all the time, and you don't. You're on the water all the time, but your fishing time is very minuscule compared to what you, you think it might be. Anyways, I, I mentioned Ryan and Mike's skill level because we did get into a hatch every single day that we were out there in February. And it was, it was kind of frustrating because with, with the exception of Ryan, I think he caught two or three, uh, on a dry fly. None of us caught anything on dry flies. I I caught a few on nymphs. Mike got a, Mike's got this thing with big fish. He can just wrangle them. He got a 27 inch rainbow on one of the little mysis shrimp that that's where he got his nickname. Mysis Mike. Cause he tied those for us. And, that that rainbow he caught was ridiculous. So if I if I can find the picture, I'll throw it up in the video podcast for you guys. And then if you're listening on audio, maybe I'll throw a link in the show notes for you if I can find a picture of that fish. Um, but anyways, the fish were clearly eating off the top, but we really couldn't figure out what exact type of midge they wanted. And I know that when I tried fishing for them just by myself, I could not get a drag free drift. To save my life, my flies were skating all over the place. It looked like the, uh, looked like ice hockey. To be completely honest with you, well, fast forward a year, and I'm back on the frying pan. But this time, I'm out there with my buddy Lander Crook, and it's the same time of year. It's February. I don't know why I decided to go back in the middle of February, but uh, Lander and I, pardon me, we got it. We got into that same hatch. We got lucky. Got into that same hatch. This time, though, I had a size 26 parachute midge pattern that Ryan had dreamed up. And in the year between the first pan trip and this one, I had spent a lot of time working on my dry fly fishing game. I, I I really spent time just looking at, okay, here's where, here's where I am not good at dry fly fishing. How can I improve? So I, I spent enough time. Plus I had that little pattern that, that Ryan dreamed up and I ended up catching a couple on dry flies on this trip with Lander, but I left the pan knowing that I, I left quite a fit, a few fish on the table, so to speak. I, I knew I hadn't fished it as well as I could have because the difference was just in a year, the difference was that I could see on the second frying pan trip, I could see the mistakes I was making. I was still trying to figure out how to troubleshoot them. 
but I could see my problems. That first trip, I, I had no clue what I was doing wrong. <laughs> I didn't know what I didn't know. And it was really frustrating because as somebody who professes to love dry flies, which I do, but who fishes dry flies very often, you know, I, I came from fishing uh, small mountain creeks and, and a little free stones through the valleys and whatnot. I thought I knew how to fish dry flies, but there is a world of difference between that kind of dry fly fishing and pressured world famous tailwater with ginormous rainbow trout dry fly fishing. So uh, there, there is a world of difference. So if, if you're in that same boat as me, where you think, yeah, I've got a good handle on my dry fly fishing. There's a world of difference. There's a lot more to learn to it. Well, a couple of months after that trip out to the frying pan with Lander, so my second frying, frying pan trip, Ryan and Mike ended up going to Oregon together. Ryan, Mike, and I, uh, we all went, and we were out fishing this blue-winged olive hatch together. And this is on a tailwater that it gets, it looks as crowded as the lower Provo. It, it, it's ridiculous how many people are out there. And the fish are pickier than me at a wing joint. Because I'll, I'll tell you one thing. You take me to get wings, I'll, I'll, I'll get wings. But I'm going to critique the heck out of that sauce. Okay? It, it better be the right balance of spice and flavor. And I don't want one to overpower the other. Because the buffalo sauce is a tricky thing. And I'm picky about how I like it. And the fish were that picky too. Plus the water was really low and clear. Which threw a whole other uh, slew of problems to overcome in, in, into the situation. Well, what ended up happening... And this rarely, rarely ever happens, but I actually fished spectacularly that day uh, on this whole trip. I did. I caught some of my best fish that I've ever caught on dry flies. And I even stuck, I, I joined the 2020 club, this little thing that Ryan and I came up with where, uh, you've got to catch a 20 inch or larger fish on a size 20 or smaller dry fly. And I caught a 22 inch Brown on a size 26 parachute midge on this trip, which Again, I'm not saying that. To, oh, look at me. It's just uh, thing, things went really well. Okay, we, I, I had the right flies. I matched them perfectly to where the fish or to what the fish were eating at any given moment. And then my hook sets were great. My presentations were good. I, I honestly couldn't do anything wrong. And those days when that happens, y you've, you've had them. Y you go out there and everything just works. You don't get any tangles. You, the hook sets are good. The fish are where they're supposed to be at all. It all clicks and it feels so good. And you think, yeah, I know stuff. And then the next day you go out and you get skunked and you, you don't know stuff. So it, it happens. And, and I bring this up not to brag. I, I'm not like, oh, look at me and how good I am. I, I'm trying to illustrate the growth curve for me because this is the same growth curve that you've got to take if you want to get, that, get to that next level of dry fly, dry fly fishing skills you're going to need to make that same level of growth that I did to, to understand and to learn those lessons that will help you become a great dry fly angler. Now, what are those lessons in particular? I, I told you I got a roadmap and I do. Well, there's three things. I, I, I spent a lot of time thinking about this and I, I really boil it down to three things. And, and I, I used to keep a fishing journal back uh, whenever this was. And I actually read through the fishing journal for some of this to, to see what I was thinking at the time. And the three things that came together that helped me progress from that first really frustrating frying pan trip to about a year and a half later and just having the best day of my life uh, in Oregon was understanding hatches. That's our first thing. How to construct a good dry fly leader and then how to present those flies. So let's dig into each of those in a little bit of detail and we'll start with hatches first. So the key to understanding hatches, uh, what I mean by when I say understanding hatches is not just, oh yeah, aquatic insects hatch. No, you need to understand the progression of a hatch and how to match your flies to that as the hatch moves on throughout the day. Now this holds true, not just for trout fishing, but honestly, any fish that you're going to chase with dry flies, a uh, carp come immediately to mind, uh, a little bit of river smallmouth fishing does as well. And you will see this play out in lakes too. So if you don't live near rivers, but there's a lot of lakes nearby, this same progression of dry fly hatches will play out there for those fish too. Now, we know that as insects hatch, everything except stoneflies, all our aquatic insects except stoneflies, enter what we call an emerger phase. It's that bit between being a nymph 
I mean a dry fly, that transition period between the two. As a mergers, they get stuck in the surface film of the water. They're trying to get out of their nymphal shuck. They're trying to dry their wings out so they can fly away and, and make more bugs for us. But while they're in this position, they're an easy target for fish. Like It's like putting a plate of wings on the counter and expecting me to walk by without eating them. Okay, that, That's how easy the target is for fish. They're, they're going to come up and hit it. They're, they're going to eat them. And in fact, fish love emergers so much that I've found them feeding only on emergers for the entirety of a hatch before. But they'll eat the emergers as long as they possibly can. Now, you can actually tell if a fish is eating uh, an emerger or the adult based on how it rises. That's our rise forms. So if you're looking at the fish and they rise and you see a soft few rings, uh, maybe you only see their dorsal fin or their tail fin, but you don't see much of the fish at all. It's just a soft, quiet rise. They're probably taking emergers. And then if you see their nose break the surface or if it's a splashier, louder rise, then they're probably taking the adults or the duns. That, that's a, another word for adults that we we use interchangeably uh, every now and then. So let's say you're out, you're starting out fishing, you're out on a river, and you know, all, all your intel tells you, you went to a fly shop and they told you, and everybody told you, okay, the blue wings are hatching. The blue winged olive mayflies are hatching. This is a big deal. Uh, you need to be on this river. Here are your flies. And you get there at nine. And maybe the hatch doesn't start till 11 or 12. Sometimes they, they take a little while. They're like me. They like to, they like to sleep in. They like to have a nice, easy morning before they get to work. The, the bugs are. So if you get there, before the hatch really takes off. The fish aren't rising. This is where, again, understanding hatch progression matters because you could start to fish little bugs that imitate emergers before the fish are even rising because those emergers aren't just always in the surface film. They are moving up through the water column. They get stuck in the surface film, but as they move up to hatch, they're still easy pickings for the fish, okay? Uh, you, you could throw some RS2, some bars of mergers at this point. Uh, unweighted nymphs are really good, like an unweighted pheasant tail would be a great nymph to drop just behind a dry fly at this point. Uh, soft tackles work very well at this point as well because all of these things look like bugs that are rising up through the water column to start hatching. So the, these are all. this is an instance, again, the, the hatch hasn't started but you're fishing a little bit before you're understanding the progression of this hatch. But once the hatch actually kicks off, that's when you would tie on your duns and focus on the fish that are eating the dry flies. But unless you actually see fish eating the duns, I would keep an emerger on all the time. In fact, when I'm fishing a, a good hatch like this, I am almost always fishing a double dry rig. I've got a dun up front, and then an emerger behind it because, again, I've watched fish eat emergers for almost the entire hatch before. They will just eat as many of those as they can. They love them, but I will do that. I'll keep an emerger behind the dun until I don't see any more emerger-style eats anymore, and then I'll switch over to a cripple as my second fly because they work very well during the hatch uh, as well. Sometimes you'll even see the fish eat the cripples instead of the duns. And a cripple is just exactly what it sounds like. It's an adult version of the bug that's stuck or crippled in some way that it, it can't get off the water. And so if the fish sees that or it sees the, the full adult with the nice upright wings, which one's an easier target for the fish? Which one's an easier meal? All right, the cripple. So they're going to go and, and eat that one and, and ignore the adult. So those cripples can be a fantastic little cheat code for these hatches. Well, as the hatch winds down with mayflies, especially you'll have a spinner fall where all the mayflies that have made it, they die and then they spin and fall back to the water surface and fish will key in on those spent bugs and go to town eating them after the hatch is mostly over. They'll start to eat those. So it's also important to have a good selection of spent wing patterns in your box for the end of the hatch as well. Knowing this hatch progression, understanding this, and, and being able to internalize this information tells you what fly to tie on at any given moment based on how the fish are acting. You don't see them rising, boom, I know little emergers, little nymphs, stuff higher in the water column, not down deep, but higher in the water column. They start rising, you can tell between an emerger and an adult. Okay, you, 
We want cripples on at that point. Then once the hatch is winded down, that's when you end up starting to fish with those spent wings that I mentioned. Understanding this takes arguably the toughest, well, I, I shouldn't say the toughest, one of the hardest things for beginners out of the equation, which is, well, what fly do I use? Okay, understanding this hatch progression, you let the fish tell you and you tie a fly on to match that, boom, you're done. Then you can focus on the other stuff, which I think is more difficult, but I know the fly selection trips up a lot of us, it trip me up all the time as a beginner too, but this other stuff is more difficult. Now, this other stuff, the leaders and presentation. So let's look at the leaders for a minute. I've actually rarely talked about leaders on the show because I just think that's one area of fly fishing where we overthink everything far too much. I all due respect to Brian Fleshig over at Mad River Outfitters. I love his stuff, love his videos. I, I'm just not convinced that one type of leader is so drastically better than another. What I mean by this is you've got your hand-tied leaders versus our store-bought ones that are uh, tapered leaders, and then the hand-tied ones are the ones where you make the taper yourself, and you have to use hard monofilament for this and soft monofilament for this, and it's got to be exactly this many inches of this, and I, I just, I, I'm not denying that they work, and if that's something that you enjoy, then all the more power to you. One of the greatest things about fly fishing is that we're able to get as in-depth or not on just about anything that we would like. And I, I just feel like if leader construction mattered so much, and it really made as big of a difference as some people say it does, then we probably would all use them instead of the, the store-bought ones. Then again, the store-bought ones are easy, and a lot of us like the simple way on a lot of things. So uh, there's a little bit to it. I've just, I, I'm not convinced that they are a, an enormous difference maker like they're made out to be. However, with all that said, I will say they do make an enormous difference when it comes to fishing with dry flies because you need to make sure that your leader, A, is sized appropriately. You've got the right size of, of tippet going to your dry fly, but that leader also needs to be long enough to softly land your small flies near the fish without spooking them, okay? The rule I like to follow uh, when I am building up a dry fly leader is I like to start with a 9-foot 4X leader. I like the little bit, the, the extra weight from the 4X. Uh, I think it carries the flies better, especially the small ones. It helps turn them over a little bit better, especially if there's any wind going on. It'll, it'll cut through better than a 5X. But then if I need to, depending on what I'm doing, I will tie on lengths of tippet that are about 15 to 20 inches long off the end of that 4X leader to get me to where I need to go. And I'll use blood knots to do that. And then that'll get me to my desired leader, desired leader size. Okay, so for example, let's say I'm fishing a double dry rig. I've got a size 16 parachute blue wing up front and then a size 22 emerger behind it. Uh, I'd go with... 15 inches of 5X to get me to that size 16 because I, I do like to err on the side of smaller with dry flies, especially in low, clear water where the fish I know are going to be picky. I'll, I'll opt for a, a little bit smaller. Just give me a, a softer, more delicate presentation. So I'll go, I'll tie 15 inches onto the end, 15 to 20. Uh, 15 is on the low end. Uh, it's, it's anywhere between 15 to 20. A 5X tip it to my 4X leader. Uh, and then I'll go to my size 16 dry fly, and then I'll take another 15 to 20 inches of 6X, and I'll t tie that onto the size 22 emerger behind it. So I've got, at this point, what, almost three extra feet on my 9-foot leader, so we're looking at close to a 12-foot leader at this point. So it's definitely longer, it's softer, it's a bit more delicate, and I rarely go smaller than 6X. Um, the only time I'll, I'll bust out the 7X or even... I've got 8X, if you can believe it. The only time I'll buzz that stuff out is if I'm fishing something smaller in a size 22 dry fly, which I, I just don't do as much as I used to. Uh, I used to fish tiny ones all the time. Now, in some cases, you might need to lengthen your leader a little bit or start out with a 5X leader instead of a 4X leader. You would do that if you're fishing the really low, clear water with a little current and there's little to no wind to deal with. You've got ideal conditions there. 
the reason that you would add the length and go down in size is you want to get as soft and delicate a presentation as possible. This is one area of dry fly fishing that a lot of anglers overlook that I don't think enough anglers pay attention to. And that is especially when it's a small hatch, it's mayflies and midges, and the fish are picky. And again, you're in that low, clear water that doesn't have a lot of current moving to it. You need to be able to land your fly as softly as a butterfly hitting the water with sore feet, as my buddy Ryan would say. Fish feeding in low, clear water are very aware of their surroundings. They know they're vulnerable. So they're keeping, they got one eye on the bugs and one eye on everything else is what it feels like. If your fly line lands too close, it's going to spook them. If a thick portion of your leader lands too close, it's going to spook them. And then if your leader doesn't spook them right off the bat, they're probably going to spot it. If it's too thick, they're probably going to spot it when they're rising to look at your fake bug, because that's going to cause some micro drag, which we'll get into in a minute. And they're immediately going to know that you're trying to trick them. So if you're casting to fish and they immediately stop rising or they start rejecting your fly, I would change your leader length and size first. Add 15 inches and go a size down. So if you were fishing five, add some length and go down to 6X at that point. Do that before you even mess with your fly, whether it's a new pattern or changing the fly size itself. Uh, and, and speaking of that, I'll, I'll dive into that for a sec. Often you're going to get with picky hatches, uh, you, you'll find that you're a size too big in your fly selection and the fish aren't, aren't going to eat because of that. Sometimes there are times when you do want a slightly bigger fly to stand out, but if you're getting rejected, your, your fly is probably a little too big. So if you consistently get rejections after you've changed your leader length and size, then switch your fly size first before you just change to another pattern entirely. That, that's, that's how I troubleshoot it when I'm having those issues out on the water myself. And in all, in all seriousness, full disclosure here, I've only found it necessary to get this picky with leader length and size when fishing mayfly or midge hatches. Uh, with caddis hatches, I, I can sometimes need to get smaller, especially if I'm on a spring creek or something. But those bugs tend to be a bit bigger than our mayflies and midges. Uh, so we, we don't need a, as small a line, I, I've found. But if you're in a mayfly or midge hatch, you're going to want to have these skills uh, committed to memory. And mayflies and midges make up an enormous part of what we're doing, okay? Uh, of, of a fish's diet, of the time we spend fishing, mayflies and midges are a big part of that. You're going to want to make sure you have these skills, if not committed to memory, that you at least have them written down somewhere or you understand, okay, I need a long leader. I need a light leader in this situation because it really is going to make a difference. Now, the other half of this, and these two kind of run together. I said presentation is the last of the three things to focus on. And I, I've said it before on this show, so if you've, if you've listened to the show before, then this isn't new. But uh, I know I'll sound like a broken record here. Uh, the single most important skill that you can master as an angler is presentation. That is the thing to spend the time on. That is the thing to spend your effort uh, on, is presentation. Okay. Now I touched on this a little bit in, in the drive or in the leader construction, but let's drill down a little bit further. Okay, what exactly does proper presentation of dry flies mean? Well, it means that you're getting that fly exactly in front of the fish with no drag. It's going to look like the real thing, and I can't stress that exactly in front of the fish enough because sometimes the fish get so picky they're not going to move out of their feeding lane. And, and picky actually might be the wrong word. There's just so many bugs or they're so keyed in on it or there's a steady enough supply coming down in this one spot that if you don't get your fly within a couple inches of where the fish is rising, then it's probably going to ignore it. I mean, just this spring, Alex and I were out on the green fishing a great blue-winged olive hatch, and there were so many times when I'd find a rising fish, Alex would get all set up with the camera, I'd throw a cast and I'd land five or six inches away from where it rose and it wouldn't look at it. But as soon as I got within a couple inches of where it rose, it was game on because again, they've got such a steady stream. They're just going to eat and eat and eat. They get into this rhythm and you need to be able to get that fly right on. I like to say, I've heard it said, oh, you put it in their kitchen. 
I want to put it on their dinner plate, not just in their kitchen. I want it on their dinner plate. That's where I want my fly to land. And that needs to be your goal as well as getting your accuracy to the point where you can get that fly, boom, exactly where it needs to be. Now, the other part of this presentation is that you're doing that without any kind of drag. But we know there's there's two kinds of drag. There's the very obvious kind of drag where your fly looks like it's just skating everywhere. It's riding a jet ski across the water. And then there's what we call micro drag. I, I uh, mentioned this a while ago. Uh, but micro drag is caused when you have tippet that's too large for the fly that you picked, or it might not even be too large. It's just still it's just still too big or too thick. It's causing just enough pull on the surface that the fly is dragging just a bit, but you can't see it. The fish can, but you can't. So if you're positive that you've got the right fly on, you know they're eating emergers, you've got an emerger pattern, and the fish keep coming up and refusing it at the last second, then change your tippet size. Go down one more size before you change the fly because there's probably some micro drag that you just can't see. That's usually the giveaway that you've got micro drag is that the fish are refusing your fly. Okay, if they still refuse it after they're downsizing your tippet, that's when you should start to start to think about uh, changing the fly, either the size or the pattern itself. And with that in mind as well, this presentation part, we've actually got uh, a new fly selection masterclass here at VFC that we uh, just started. When was it? Last week? Two weeks ago? I think two weeks ago. Uh, and the next episode coming out is all about presentation coming up here soon. So keep an eye on the VFC YouTube channel. You'll get to see everything that we just talked about presentation wise, but you'll get to actually see it. It's a YouTube video, right? It's not a, not a podcast. So you'll get to see it all in practice out there on the water. It'll be very helpful for those who need to up their presentation game as well. Now, just like with every single week, we're done with the main part of the show, but don't go anywhere, folks, because we've got the Q&A section of this week's show coming right up. One of the most frequently asked questions we get from both beginners and experienced anglers is what fly should I use? With the thousands of fly patterns that exist, it can be completely overwhelming. That's why we've put together an entire ebook that walks you through everything about bugs and picking the right fly, no matter where you're fishing. So if you want to level up your skills and start catching more fish, click or tap the link in the show notes to get this ebook for free. All right, back to the show. Every week, we dedicate half the show to directly answering questions that we get from our listeners and viewers. And often the questions that y'all send in will become the basis for the open of the show as well. So if you've got a question that you would like answered, please send those in. There's always a link to do that in the show notes. We need your questions. We love them. And I love to hear from all y'all. So get, keep those questions flowing on in, please. And Lance from Tennessee is going to start us out this week. Uh, he wrote in and asked, will you recommend a book or video showing a brand new angler uh, how to tie needed knots for fly fishing? Hate to buy your starter kit if I cannot master the knots first. Well, Lance, we've actually got an entire video on tying knots. It's in our beginner master class. And I will link that in the show notes for you and everybody else to take a look at as well. Um, one thing though, the knots for fly fishing are really easy. They're they're not difficult. I mean, I always struggled with knots in Boy Scouts. I, I I'm an Eagle Scout. I did Boy Scouts growing up and whatnot. Um, and I always I remember the my neighbor across the street was the guy who passed off our knots for all our advancements and merit badges. And he was a jerk. Uh, he was not a nice feller. And I'd sit there and I'd tie these knots and I'd do it wrong. And he'd, yeah, what, what were you thinking when you were doing that? That's the dumbest knot I've ever seen. And he'd just go off and holler. Again, he was not a nice individual. No one's going to do that to you with your fishing knots. And they're significantly easier than those Boy Scout knots too. There's really only three knots you've got to understand um, the clinch knot, the surgeon's knot, and the loop-to-loop -loop connection. The clinch knot is what we use to tie our flies uh, onto our leader or to create multiple fly rigs. Uh, the surgeon's knot is what we use to put pieces of tippet together uh, to attach tippet to leader. And then the loop-to-loop -loop connection, uh, you'll notice when you pull your leaders out and your fly line out, they both have a loop 
on one end, and that's just hooking those two together so that you've got a good, secure connection between your fly line and your leader. They're very simple knots. They'll take 15, 20 minutes to master, uh, maybe. And and I would say, honestly, don't worry about mastering these knots before you buy the starter kit either, uh, because I, I think it actually helps to practice more with the materials that you're going to use to actually tie these knots. So practicing with your leaders and tippet, because I know that for myself, when I was learning the nail knot, for example, excuse me, that's a, that's a tough knot. The nail knot can be, uh, I, I could tie it just fine with pieces of rope. I didn't have any issues, but as soon as I switched to tying it with leader and fly line, it was a pain in the butt. <laughs> so I wish I would have just started learning to do it with the leader and fly line in the first place. So that's just my two cents, but don't stress about the knots. They're simple. Again, we've got that video there for you, and thanks for sending your question in, Lance. I appreciate it. Connor from Utah has our next question, writes in and says, Hey, big fan of the show. I just started fly fishing earlier this year, and I love it. I have immersed myself in fly fishing content. I've been to my local fly shops. I even listened to Untangled while at work. I, I, bet, I bet your work production has gone through the roof since you started listening to Untangled at work, right? <laughs> uh, sorry, I'll, I'll get back to your question, Connor. Something I have noticed is that so much fly fishing content is specific to fishing on a river for trout species. One of my favorite things about fishing is the variety of experiences. I love to fish for trout, but pan fishing, bass fishing, and trips to the ocean for some saltwater fishing are all things that I love uh, just as much. On top of that, I have enjoyed fly fishing on reservoirs and ponds more than rivers. My question is, why does so much of fly fishing focus on river fishing for trout? Is it about efficacy? Are bait and lure fishermen just that much more effective in these other areas of fishing? Thanks for all your content, and thanks for taking my question. Well, Connor, thank you. And this is an astute question. I'll break out my English teacher vocabulary there for y'all. This, this is an astute question. Um, the obsession with trout and fly fishing, uh, I think the reason that exists is because fly fishing is tailor-made for fishing to trout and rivers. Uh, are these long, graceful casts that we're using, those are perfect for fishing with dry flies. And in a lot of ways, fly rods are superior to uh, river fishing than spinning rods or bait casting rods. I, I will definitely give spinning rods the edge in still water, but I, I think fly rods have the edge uh, in moving water. And, and that's, where, that's where fly fishing started as well, was in moving water water. So that, that's one part of it. And then there's another part of it where a uh, little history lesson here, this feller named Isaac Walton wrote a book called The Complete Angler in 1653. And that's one of the earliest books on fly fishing. And the subtitle for that book is The Contemplative Man's Recreation. And one of his quotes from the book is, rivers and the inhabitants of the watery elements are made for wise men to contemplate and for fools to pass by without consideration. So fly fishing has always had this air of exclusivity to it. You've got, it's tailor-made for rivers, in my opinion. And then there's the exclusivity side of it, too. Because for a long time, it was only rich people who could afford to do it. And even today, in, in all honesty, you've got to have some disposable income to go fishing. Uh, you need more to go fly fishing, but you need some to go fishing, period. Then you need time to do it, which none of us ever have enough of anyways. And then when you look at the majority of history of fishing in, uh, in rivers, often it's been private rivers where a lot of that's taken place, where you, some lord or earl, you know, says, I'm on my state and I'm fishing for speckled trout today or whatever. And it's still, honestly, it's still that way in a lot of Europe where you've got to pay to fish in a lot of water over there, a lot of private water still. So for a long time, that's just how fishing was regarded, fly fishing in particular was regarded. And then here in America, at least, that really started to change in the 60s, and it's still continuing to change. It's less and less uh, uh, highbrow. Now, I mean, shoot, I just saw a news story this morning. Drake just launched a line of fly fishing apparel uh, with Nike, for crying out loud. And I, I don't even, I, I don't think I've ever even heard a Drake song. That's not my kind of music, but it, 60, 70 years ago, that probably wouldn't have happened, right? It, 
it just wouldn't have been. Those worlds don't mix, but we're starting to see the worlds mix now where fly fishing is less highbrow than it used to be. Okay. But the reason that I think the focus still remains on fishing rivers for trout with a fly rod, why that dominates the fly fishing industry so much is, again, it's what I said at the beginning. Fly fishing is tailor-made for this. There's, There might be a more effective way to do it. Maybe uh, you, you, could, you could drop a worm and run and catch fish. You're going to do it. But what other way are you going to effectively catch the fish as they're actively eating their caddis or their mayflies? They're feeding on a surface hatch. How, how are you going to do that with anything other than a dry fly rod? Right. It, it just, it, it's fly fishing solves that problem. It's the solution to how do I catch those fish that I see rising? Fly fishing does that for us. Okay. I also think that one thing we don't do a good enough job of in the fly fishing industry, and I'm, I'm as guilty of this as anybody else, is not talking about how there's significant overlap between the skills that we develop for fishing for trout in rivers and the skills that you need to catch a lot of other species. Again, I'll give the edge to spinning gear in still water. I think they've got it. But think about fishing for smallmouth, smallmouth bass in a river. If you're going to go do that, you still need to read water. You need to know where the fish are going to be. You need to identify bugs and what are they eating, okay? You need to still make good casts. You need good hook sets. And you need to fight the fish properly. That's all stuff that you are going to learn from trout fishing. Or if you grew up doing smallmouth river fishing and you want to switch over to do some trout fishing, that's all stuff you learn doing that too. Okay. There's a lot of overlap there. I mean, shoot, even even think about carp fishing for crying out loud. You're sight fishing to giant fish that suck flies off the bottom. Sometimes they'll come up and eat dry flies, but you've got to have pinpoint accuracy. You've got to have a very lifelike presentation and can't spook them at all. You've got to have perfect timing on the hook set. That's all stuff that you learn from trout fishing. Now, the hook set is different uh, with carp than, than a lot of trout fishing. You're doing a strip set instead of a trout set. But still, that's all stuff you learn from trout fishing or vice versa, right? There's, there's really not a whole lot, though, in trout fishing that translates over to saltwater, except maybe spotting fish. But even then, that feels kind of apples and oranges to me. Uh, but there's actually a lot of correlation between saltwater fishing and chasing carp on the fly rod than you probably initially thought. So we don't do a good enough job pointing out the overlap between the skill sets. And there's just so much romance involved with fly fishing for trout in rivers in the West in particular. That's just, there's this romantic ideal that's I don't want to say that's what we all aspire to, but I think that's what attracts a huge majority of us to fly fishing is catching trout in beautiful places. It's just a different experience. Again, it's that solution to the problem of how do I catch these fish that are rising to dry flies? Boom, fly fishing is the most effective way to do that. And that's just my two cents on your question, Connor. I really like it though. Thank you for sending that in. I, uh, again, don't, don't let the obsession with trout and rivers distract you from all the different skills you can learn and apply to whatever other kind of fly fishing that you want to do. But thanks again for sending that question in, man. I appreciate it. Zach from Indiana has our next question. Writes in and says, when should you play a fish on the reel and when is it better to just strip in line to land a fish? Well, Zach, that all depends on the fish. Uh, there's no there's no right or wrong. There's no do it this way. If, if this happens, there's no equation really to plug into. Okay, it really just depends on what does the fish do. That's going to dictate how you fight that fish. Okay. If, if the fish takes your fly immediately and starts making this really big run or it starts pulling hard, then it's probably best to put it on the reel and, and use the reel to help you land that fish. Uh, if you're in big, heavy water, it's also really nice to have the reel to help wrangle the fish in through the heavier currents and whatnot. But if you're out on a small mountain stream or you're hooking into smaller fish, then you probably don't need to put them on the reel. Just strip the line in. Uh, in all honesty, I do both. Uh, when, I, when I'm fishing all types of water, it really just depends on what the fish does. 
Uh, the reel is there to provide resistance as the fish makes big runs uh, and to manage your slack line. That's what the reel exists for. It's part of your toolkit for landing fish. It's not an either or. You don't only strip line in or only use the reel. It's part of the kit for what you're doing. So I'll give you an example. If I make a 30-foot cast with a dry dropper rig upstream and a fish takes my fly within the first few feet of that drift, there's a decent chance I'm going to put that fish on the reel because there's so little slack line out at the moment that I'm going to set the hook and it's going to go almost tight instantly. The reel is more convenient at that point, but if it's not that big or I'm not in very fast current, I might just strip the line in too. It, it really just depends on what the fish does. Now, in that same drift, if the fish takes 20 feet into the drift, I'm almost certainly going to just strip the line, excuse me, just strip the line in because Unless that fish makes a big run upstream or downstream, then I'm just going to strip it in, get it in the net, get the hook out, get it back to the water as soon as I can. Uh, but if it makes a big run, then, then I'll put it on the reel. It all just depends on what the fish does. So let the fish tell you what you need to do in order to help land it. So uh, thank you for sending that question in, Zach. I appreciate it. And with that, folks, we are not done with the show yet because we've got the Live Real Life moment coming right up. Each week on the show, we end with the live a real life moment. This is a chance for you to share pictures and stories or even videos of you out there on the water living real life and having a blast. That's our whole goal at VSC is to help you live real life, get out on the water and have a great time. We want to hear about your successes, hear about your stories or your observations, whatever it is. If you've got a live real life moment you would like to have read and featured on the show, please uh, submit yours. There's a link to do that in the show notes. And this week's Live Real Life moment comes from James. Going all the way back to my pre-high school days, I purchased a fly rod and reel from Sears and Roebuck Company with lawn mowing money. With no one to teach me to cast or how to fish, I was able to only catch a few bluegills and panfish on poppers. After college, medical, medical school, residency training, and early practice medicine, I really had no time for fishing. However, about 30 years ago, I decided I wanted to try fly fishing again. I invested in an Orvis Rocky Mountain 8-foot 6-weight rod and Madison 3 reel. Still having no one to mentor me and teach me, I fished very rarely and again only caught small panfish. I have been paying dues to Trout Unlimited for years. I'm very interested in conservation, so I belong to Trout Unlimited, Ducks Unlimited, and Pheasants Forever. So about four or five years ago, I began to become involved in our local chapter. The Little Elkhart chapter of Trout Unlimited is very active in maintaining the Little Elkhart River near, Mid near Middlebury, Indiana, as a trout stream, and the Browns are thriving. From them, I learned fly tying and began to get mentoring on fly fishing. Two years ago, I took a vacation trip to lower Wisconsin near Madison with my wife. I got to spend a day on a small creek in the Wisconsin Driftless. I had few bites, but no fish on the hook. I went back last year when I got two browns on the hook, but I was unable to land them. Keep your lines tight. And finally, this spring, I landed my first two browns in the Little Elkhart. I caught them on my original Orvis Rocky Mountain Rod and Madison 3 reel with a fly which I tied. I also had another dancing on the water, but it escaped. Keep tension on the line. Here's the photo of the first. Uh, both were kept in the water and released to strongly swim away. Now I am hooked. Uh, Jim, thanks a bunch for sending that in. That, that's really cool to see your progression as you go. Uh, all those years, I, I don't know how doctors do it and be completely honest with all that school and work and residency. I just, I, I couldn't do it. There's a reason I fish instead of being a doctor, but, uh, that's a fun little story, Jim. I really appreciate you sending that in. And with that folks, we are going to end this week's show. Thank you so much for being here with us this week. I appreciate it. Uh, I love getting to do this every week. Love getting to hear from y'all with your questions and whatnot. Uh, if you've got a question you'd like answered or a live real life moment you want to submit to the show, there's links to do that in the show notes. Please send those in. Uh, we've also got our free online community. It's like Facebook, but it doesn't suck. There's no politics. You can just go in there and talk about fishing. There's a link to join that in the show notes as well. It's a lot of fun. Definitely want to jump into the community if you can. And if you could, if you haven't already, please rate and subscribe to the show wherever you're listening to it. The more ratings and subscriptions we get means we get a larger audience and a larger reach and we can help more people get out there on the water and live real life, which is what we are all about 
here at VFC. And until next week, everybody, have a great one. Get out on the water, enjoy yourself, and tie lines.